Hi everyone, welcome to the Addiction Recovery Channel, or ARC. I am Ed Baker, and I am your host producer. Today, we are privileged indeed to have as our guest, Dr. Todd Mandel. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, Todd, for being on the show. Pleasure. Dr. Mandel is a board-certified psychiatrist with added qualifications in addiction psychiatry. Todd has a lot of experience listening to people with mild, moderate, and severe substance use disorder. <clears throat> Todd has over 30 years experience in the field of addictions, both providing direct services to patients and also in the administration of programs and projects specifically focused on this population. <clears throat> Dr. Mandel, also Todd, in, please. enjoy Todd Todd also enjoys the distinction of having co-founded the Northern New England chapter of the American Society of Addiction Medicine. <clears throat> I guess, you know, the way I'd like to begin the show is to give you an opportunity to share with the audience what it was about this particular population, people with addiction. <clears throat> that uh, caused you to dedicate your career to working with them? Well, it's actually very interesting. A supervisor of mine during my psychiatric residency had said to me, Todd, addiction psychiatry is where you need to go. And I said, why? He said, you're going to have a huge opportunity to work with a very diverse population and to help people. Mm. And you'll be able to see that uh, take place over the years. And as it turned out, the job offers that I had after residency all involved programs that had a psychiatric component and an addictions component mm -hmm. and the rest is the 30 years. Yeah, so you something resonated and you grew into it? Yes. <clears throat> What's it been like for you? Has it been a rewarding experience? I would say very rewarding overall. There have been a lot of frustrations um, policy frustrations, people not having access to the treatment they need, yeah. the stigma that we continue to talk about in all areas of addiction, sure, sure. and when we lose patients, yeah. it's a heartbreak. Yeah. Um, but overall, I've seen patients have come up to me many years after we worked together, and they said, I'm getting it, Doc, and yeah. it does my heart good. Yeah, sometimes you'll see them with... Uh you know, fruitful employment, wonderful families, physical health, mental health. It's a beautiful thing. Yep. You get to see that. I find you get to see that if you live, like I live in a, I was living in a very small town where I also practiced. And you just, you know, you just, you just see it. You see the fruits of your labor. Yep. It's a beautiful thing, Todd. So I'd like to begin now by setting a, like a context for the show. <clears throat> The U.S. Uh, mortality rate has gone up three consecutive years. Converse to this, our life expectancy has dropped for three consecutive years. Most of the top ten causes of death in America are declining year over year. However, the third leading cause of death, which is unintentional injuries, has climbed both in rate and rank. This is profound. <clears throat> Driving this are deaths due to drug poisoning, drug overdose. 72,000 Americans in 2017, roughly. 70,000 Americans in 2018, roughly, were taken by drug overdose death. <clears throat> Annual deaths due to drug overdoses presently exceed those from motor vehicle deaths, gun violence, and the HIV epidemic at its height in the 1990s. This is addiction in action. Today's show uh, will focus upon the American Society of Addiction Medicine's recent revision of their 2011 definition of addiction. <clears throat> it's important that we understand what addiction is. So I'll begin by reading the definition and then we'll begin discussing it. 
This is the 2019 uh, definition, quote, addiction is a treatable chronic medical disease involving complex interactions among brain circuits, genetics, the environment, and an individual's life experience. <clears throat> People with addiction use substances or engage in behaviors that become compulsive and often continue despite harmful consequences. <clears throat> So with that, Todd, you know, I'd like to just ask you to elaborate a little on that definition. What do you think is important for the general public to understand about that definition? Well, I think the fact that it's become much more multifactorial in terms of dis the description of, of the disease process. At one point, I think it was in 2011 that we talked about, we really talked about the brain changes, and that's quite real. However, it's not all that's not the only explanation. And the fact that ASAM now talks about life experiences, the environment, genetics, it's much more multifactorial than just the brain changes, mm -hmm. even though the brain changes, as I said, are quite real. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> there's like a, a, a strong emphasis on the environment, including, and I'll read, I'll read again, because I think it's important to get it out the way that ASAM is explaining it. <clears throat> The updated definition underscores the complex interplay of unique biological, psychological, and environmental conditions that have a role in any one individual's addiction. Genetics can determine how brain circuits function in a person predisposed to addiction, and stressors, and this is really the crucial point I think that you're underlining, stressors such as adverse childhood experiences, lack of healthy social supports, and limited prospects for employment or stable housing can exert significant pressure on the brain circuitry of individuals at risk for addiction. So it's capturing, I, I guess it's called the epigenetic... Good word. ...dynamic. Mm -hmm. Do you care to elaborate on that a little bit? <clears throat> well, I think one of the um, examples that I give very frequently is if someone is hungry no matter how motivated they are to work on their recoveries, because yeah. we talk about mental health issues and substance use issues, so I use an S at the end of that. Mm -hmm. If they're hungry, it's gonna be very difficult for them to stay focused on the work they need to do. Yeah. If they're living under a bridge, it's gonna be very d difficult. Yeah. Likewise, no matter how motivated they may yeah. be at that time. So, what are the stressors that a given person is trying to manage at the same time as they're trying to manage their treatment and their recoveries? Yeah. So it's very easy to look at this conglomerate, which is a really nice way of describing it, but how does it affect each given person? And everyone's unique just like everyone else. Sure. So how do you help a person deal with all of the rest of the um, factors that are going on and maybe working against them in their efforts at recovery. Yes, and I, well, well put. And what, what I've noticed about this is that some of the factors that can contribute to the development of addiction are the same factors that contribute to the perpetuation of addiction right. and that also feed into making recovery so, so difficult and, and, and sometimes impossible. You know, I'm, I'm, I know you've seen it because you've been in the field for a long time and so have I that we would have people who would be discharged from uh, a residential treatment program with no drugs in their system and in the very beginnings of, of, of the possibility of brain healing, discharged into a community where drugs were prevalent and there was not even, a re some of them didn't even have a referral for psychotherapy. There was not a lot of AA and NA around and there certainly were no recovery centers. So these people were kind of discharged back into an environment that was almost overwhelmingly in favor of, of relapse. Well, certainly at the time of discharge from any type of long-term program is a high, time, high risk time for relapse, mm -hmm. potential relapse, overdose, and potential death. Mm -hmm. So it's a particularly scary time or a risky time for a person and handing someone a referral a paper, a card yeah. with a referral name on it isn't really enough. We right. call it the warm handoff is much better. Mm -hmm. And 
modeling to patients how they can advocate for themselves with a new provider. We don't give a name of a cardiologist for a person with um, heart problems and expect them to call themselves without a referral. Mm -hmm. There weren't many resources available for substance use disorders, but now that there are more of them, how do we help with the better handoff so that the person betters their chances of getting to their first appointment? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and, I th and then retaining them. Yes, well retention's a tough one. And I think this is the, the, the basic thrust of the revised ACM definition is to underscore exactly what we're speaking about. That, that resources must be allocated that will affect the environmental conditions that people find themselves functioning within. Uh, housing is huge. People being released from um, incarcerated, you know, uh, time in incarcerated, if they don't have adequate housing, what are they supposed to do? They're in a tough spot. Right. Medications for addiction, counseling for addiction, recovery coaching for addiction. All these uh, basic inputs need to be funded at, a, at an increased rate over time if we're going to make lasting um, progress in this particular area. I agree with you. The having resources at the type that is needed by that given person at that given time. We talk about having enough beds. Well, it isn't always beds. It's what's, what is the treatment that this particular person who's coming out of a residential program or out of incarceration needs at that time. Mm -hmm. and it may not be a bed, but it may be a outpatient treatment, uh, intensive outpatient day treatment. But being able to put those resources together for that given person's needs is, that's a tough, that's tough. We're, we're having to cobble together things for folks and relying on public transportation potentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are other uh, forces, for example, if they leave incarceration and they're on probation, uh, parole, whatever, whichever one it is, and they have the expectations of the uh, the legal providers and how many urine tests and how many appointments they have to go to, as well as the, the rest of the recovery work. It can be mm, very challenging for a person to get to all their appointments that they need to get if they don't own a car, if they don't have a stable place to live. Ha realistic expectations is, a, is key also. And I, I think one of the things, and, and that again is well put, I think one of the things that we're seeing today, especially in Vermont, and I think Vermont is a little bit different than a lot of other it states is, in America. It is. Yep. One, one of the things we're seeing in Vermont today is a, like an acute uh, new awareness of this idea of addiction being a brain disease and that we have to respond to it in very certain ways or people are not going to get better. Now, I know that you served as the medical director for the Office of Alcohol and Drug Programs here in Vermont during a very formative uh, period <clears throat> when we were, you know, the uh, opioid epidemic was beginning. I think you were part of rolling out methadone and uh, buprenorphine and certainly yes. expanding uh, a treatment uh, opportunities for people. <clears throat> what's happened since then, and I think what you, you laid a lot of the groundwork for what's happened since then, what's happening since then is, is actually profound. and. Um, you know, on, on many levels, we have uh, uh, recovery supportive housing now. We're expanding that. People are being licensed so that the housing is of uh, the, the best possible quality. We have the Agency of Transportation uh, looking at ways to get people to AA meetings and NA meetings and appointments. Uh, we have um, recovery friendly workplaces being developed so people can actually, you know, um, <clears throat> secure meaningful employment. We have just so much going on in Vermont today. And I think it's in recognition of, of the, the, the profound nature of addiction. And I'd like to go into that a little bit, that what, what the um, ASAM is calling addiction is specifically a brain disease that develops in the later phases of substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. So we have three phases of substance use disorder, 
mild, moderate, and severe. And the American Society of Addiction Medicine is saying, we want to use the term addiction for the more severe manifestations of substance use disorder. Do you care to comment on that? What, what, what is it that occurs in the brain at those later stages that differentiates uh, addiction from mild substance use disorder? Well, first let me comment that I think that giving the scale, the sliding scale of severity is a really important piece. It, it used to be Mm, not all or nothing, but it wasn't as descriptive as it is now, mm -hmm. and they call it substance use disorders to remove some of the stigmatizing words from the definition. Yes, yes. Someone who may be using substances at a recreation level that may be too much, and they start to suffer consequences from it and change their behaviors tend to be in the milder, and they haven't had the <clears throat> brain changes, which we talk about the... And I know Dr. Brooklyn previously has talked about the pleasure center and the reward center yes. and neurotransmitters less likely to have occurred at the lower level of severity. On the other hand, there are people who use crack cocaine a couple of times mm. and they start to have changes mm -hmm. pretty early on and the, and the compulsion yeah. um, comes up pretty quickly. The other people, as you, we talk about kids of college who Unfortunately, there's a lot of substance abuse, use, just substance use, let's say, at college, and um, someone gets an ultimatum from their family, I'm not gonna continue to pay for your education mm -hmm. unless you straighten up, mm -hmm. and they do. Yeah. yeah, Some people are not as fortunate. But as the disease progresses for whatever substance, and they're different in terms of how they progress, but when the brain changes occur, it's not so much something that I could say, okay, I'm putting this down anymore no matter what the ultimatum may, may be. Right. It can happen, but often there's a lot more treatment, a lot more resource that's needed. Yeah, and I, I think that's such an important distinction. And I like the way you further uh, distinguish that that process can accelerate at different rates depending on the person and depending on the drug. And it's not just one size fits all. It's very, very complex. So when we generalize we get ourselves in trouble. When the general yes. public uh, receives information that's generalized, the perceptions that they begin to adhere to uh, tend to be um, not accurate and very often can lead to stigma. You know, one of the things I heard you say was, okay, so we'll take the, the college student that's uh, with a, a falling grade point because of, let's say, alcohol use or alcohol and marijuana use. <clears throat> not studying, not getting enough sleep, um, you know, using drugs too frequently. <clears throat> so the person's parent says, you know, your grade point is going down. If it goes down another two points, you're out of there. We're not going to pay for your tuition, your room and board. You're going to have to come home and, and get a job. <clears throat> so... It's the prefrontal cortex, really. The executive function of the brain says, let me weigh out the consequences, the rewards, the punishments, my options, and let me choose whatever the best route is for me, rationally. The person makes the choices and says, okay, I have to stop, you know, I have to decrease my involvement with drugs. I can't, I can't succeed at college unless I do. And they have the wherewithal to do that because their brain isn't yet compromised by addiction. That, that's really important for us to understand because I think part of the misunderstanding that's occurring is that someone with addiction, someone with severe substance use disorder, where that whole prefrontal cortex has been impaired and they're sort of victims to their own impulses, they can hardly resist impulses in spite of consequences that we sort of think or, 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 or uninformed people will think that, that people with addiction can just think their way out of it or decide their way out of it without treatment. This, I think, is a dangerous uh, misconception. I think you're quite right about that. I will hearken back to an experience I think we discussed in preparing for the program is that I once testified at a different, in a different state at a Senate hearing, and I was like, 
came up to the podium to give my spiel about the need for medication-assisted treatment to continue in the area, I was told, before you start, Dr. Mandel, don't quote us science. Mm -hmm. I said, what else don't is there? Don't quote us science. I mean, isn't that the core of the, mm. the definitions? The, we're looking at a brain disease. They said, stop talking about science. I said, well, what would you like me to talk about? They said, decreasing the expense of substance use treatment in the state. Wow. <clears throat> so I couldn't even get to the other issues that ASAM has so elegantly put down. Not only is there a brain, a brain changes, documentable brain changes, but all the rest of the factors that they talk about, there was nothing left to say. Wow. And I, was, I came away from the podium really frustrated. I said, why am I being asked a question like that when we don't cut off funding for people with cardiac problems, people with um, seizure disorders mm -hmm. that may have relapsing uh, conditions, may have uh, courses of their treatment, yeah. Uh, yeah. diabetes. What youngster yeah. who comes down with diabetes doesn't want to eat cake? Right. And right. goes in and, 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 and has a problem. And, and, and once in a while will, yeah. Well, often, yeah, <laughs> until, yeah. until things square away with them and they realize that they have to take responsibility, which they can do. Um, but it was very frustrating to me to be told not to quote science. Don't say evidence-based. Don't say that the, uh, the studies will show. Yeah, it that's was, shocking. It was how do you cut down the expense? And I was... Um, to stick with that point for a second, I was really recently asked by someone who said, well, Todd, how come they, you don't give people two shots at this and then they're off? I said, do we do that for any other part of medicine or, or, or anything, two shots? How could you possibly, and, I, and he said, I, I guess you're right. I said, people? You have yeah. people here that, were, that are dying because of this disease and you yeah. want to say two shots, yeah. two shoot shots of treatment? Yeah. Very frustrating. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we need to regroup as a, as a culture. And, and, and I think that's happening because of the widespread nature of disease and lethality in America today, that there seems to be more and more attention being paid to it. There's grassroots movements. And I, I'm a little bit... Um, like tunnel visioned because I spend my time in Vermont. And if you live in Vermont, you feel, actually you feel optimistic, like we do have some hope with this. But I know it's not uh, the case for the rest of uh, the country. You know, the um, ASAM goes on with one last sentence. And I think you, you touched on it just now eloquently. They say that prevention efforts and treatment approaches for addiction are generally as successful as those for other chronic diseases. So do you care to elaborate on that a little bit? Well, let's look at the use of antibiotics. Who of us or has taken their full course of antibiotics and not left half of it in the medicine chest after you felt better? Mm -hmm. So medication compliance across the board in medicine is not 100%. It's not even close. So how can we expect folks that have this constellation of risk factors and brain changes to be perfect? Mm -hmm. We're all human. We all make mistakes and we all um, have setbacks. So um, the fact that ASAM is trying to perhaps normalize the, the, the substance use disorders into routine medical yeah. jargon yeah. to say, this is just like any other disease. We yeah. have to work on prevention. We have smoking prevention. Yeah. We have DWI prevention. Yeah. What's the difference? And we don't ever say to someone, um, you only get uh, two shots at two, two chances to have your, um, uh, your asthma or your uh, emphysema treated. Sure. Or oh, cancer, radiation, chemo. For if you don't stop. Oh. Yeah. All right. I get excited with no, it's uh, a good talking, it's, it's, talking it's, it's, about it's a very, talking about addictions. It's a very and important point. We don't put that kind of limit on anybody else. Mm. Why should we put it on folks that are suffering from addiction, substance use disorders, or addictive disease, who also may have a 
mental health issue or yeah. medical issues that go along with it that may also be barriers to their getting better. Mm -hmm. Why would we put that kind of artificial uh, limit on exposure to treatment? Well, I mean, the, the answer, I mean, that, that, you know, the most obvious answer is stigma, mm -hmm. right? And, and you and I today are mightily fighting against stigma by bringing out information that is accurate and timely for the general public. And a lot of the general public seems to be catching on. But, but still, stigma is alive and well in, a, in, a, in America today, and I'm sure we're, we're all too painfully aware of that. <clears throat> you know, I'd like to just focus a little bit more on the, the commentary on the um, definition. <clears throat> They say, ASAM says, we will not be able to punish our way out of the crisis, and we must face the reality that stern talks about drug use will not treat a devastating disease. Blanket punitive policies, including incarceration without access to evidence-based addiction treatment medications, ignore science. <clears throat> we have no evidence that a felony charge or time in jail cell addresses the underlying disease and the consequences of incarceration only add further pressures that make it more difficult to manage the illness. So it seems like they're really trying to, to get at the fabric of what is perpetuating, you know, addiction in America. This misunderstanding that a stern warning or a punishment or the war on drugs, like that's going to work. It's just not going to work. And they also begin to look at profound cultural and, and societal arrangements, you know, adverse childhood experiences, uh, poverty, um, difficulties, uh, you know, seeking and, and, and acquiring full, uh, meaningful employment. I mean, they really begin to focus on some of the underlying um, societal conditions that set people up for addiction. Do you care to, to talk about that a little bit? Like, what is your, do you have hope that, that the American culture, the American society can really begin to, to get real about this and not just focus on the symptoms and focus on the fatalities, but at the same time, without taking resources away from people with addiction, focus on some of the underlying causes? Well, let's back up for just a moment and look at the stigma that exists within the treatment provider networks. Okay. One of the things, one of the, um, the tip for substance, the, the substance abuse, su substance abuse, uh, SAMHSA, um, talks about is that s someone showing evidence of their substance use behaviors, for example, a positive drug screen, does not mean they should be discharged. Mm -hmm. And that's been an uphill battle for some programs is that one positive drug screen, and we don't say dirty anymore, <clears throat> right? dirty or clean, one positive uh, drug screen means you're out of treatment. How does that help the person when they're just exhibiting symptoms of the problems that brought them into treatment? Of course. So even within the treatment network. We still have our own uh, baggage to clean up. And at the same time, we're asking the greater populace to say, we would like very much for you to understand that folks with substance use disorders need treatment. It may be a chronic nature. The um, duration of someone, for example, being on buprenorphine or uh, methadone is strictly an agreement between the provider and the client. Mm -hmm. There's no set guidelines as to when someone ought to come off it. Mm -hmm. There's no set guidelines as to when someone needs to come off their Dilantin, if ever, for a seizure disorder. Yeah. And I tend to use the seizure disorders more than the diabetes model that people mm -hmm. talk about. They're, they're both very applicable. Mm -hmm. But how do we, what ACM is trying to do, normalize or embrace addiction, substance use disorders into the medical model, into the medical, into general medicine. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think that as providers, we need to set an example. So along those lines, you can have a, a, a provider's office, a physician's office, 
with a waiting room, maybe a group practice with five physicians in a waiting room with maybe 10 people in it. And two of those people might be there to see their doctor um, for a urine drug screening and to have a buprenorphine uh, a prescription, you know, updated. Mm -hmm. And they're just in the waiting room with everybody else who has some sort of medical condition, and it's just seen as the same. Nobody knows why anybody's there. It's all confidential. You're here for buprenorphine. You're here for this medication. You're here for a checkup. Whatever. It's all just part of the American health landscape. Is that what, what you that mean? Was, that was the original intent of <clears throat> yeah. the release of buprenorphine. Mm -hmm. It was office-based treatment, mm -hmm. just like any other person coming in for any other problem. Just a little bit more training, because we know no other medicine has required eight hours of training mm -hmm. to be able to prescribe it. But that was the point. It was office-based treatment mm -hmm. to normalize, mm -hmm. as opposed to, and um, some people have trouble with going to a methadone clinic. <clears throat> some people have trouble going to AA. So it's trying to match the treatment approach and setting for the person, not just the medicine. All right, and, and I think that the, the, that profession, ASAM, uh, social workers, certainly licensed alcohol drug counselors, uh, licensed mental health uh, counselors, there's a lot of private practitioners out there, there's a lot of programs and projects focused on this that are all kind of, you know, moving this ball forward. And a lot of the attention today, rightly so, I do believe, is moving toward the underlying conditions that persist in the American culture that sets the stage to make people more vulnerable to addiction. Now, you know, how do you, do you have hope about that? Having been in the field for a long time and having seen the progress that you've seen, do you think that we will actually, this time, because I've seen uh, profound starts to do something about this a number of times during the course of my career, but I can honestly say to you that I have never seen a groundswell of compassion that has the kind of traction that this one does before in my lifetime. So I, I do feel hopeful. We have trauma-based education today in Vermont. We have trauma-based psychotherapeutic uh, treatment in Vermont. People are looking at ACEs. People are looking at getting to families and giving them more support. So there are, are things afoot, and, and it's expanding these things over time, never saying, and this is the, the difference that I see today, people are not saying you know, we've done enough. People are not resting on their laurels. People are really you know, ready to, to, to move forward. <clears throat> Do you have hope that over the, the next you know, two decades, that we will make you know, significant progress in the underlying causes. I do, actually, and I'm aware of many what we would call grassroots initiatives by different medical societies to bring, for example, to bring um, medication-assisted treatment into the emergency rooms. Yeah. How do you begin someone, yeah. for example, on buprenorphine when you've screened, they seem to have a substance use disorder opioid dependence, as we used to call it, and they're showing signs of withdrawal. How do we get them connected to treatment yeah. right then? Yeah. How do we provide education about overdose prevention for people who are in uh, medication-assisted treatment for substance use disorders, as well as for pain management? What are the tips we can get people to look for? And certainly, um, more police officers are carrying um, Naloxone. naloxone kits with them, sure. and that was a, there was major pushback to that in a lot of areas. Yeah. Why bother having folks with addiction problems ha use with impunity? Mm -hmm. Why would you not want to have them have a rescuing available, available to them any time that they're using? So there are quite a, a lot of initiatives, but we also have to remember that in addition to the medical piece, the medicine piece, what about the rest of the factors? Mm -hmm. And I'm not as involved in those initiatives. Societal factors. Right. And I hear about them and I'm aware of the different mm -hmm. uh, programs that are offered, different levels of care. How do we make treatment at the time that's needed, at the level that's needed, more available 
as and that includes all managing all the rest of the factors that we're talking about. Right, and and not not playing one off against the other, Correct. like it's either or. It, it it must be both simultaneously if we're really to make a difference. And I, and I think if you if you look at AIDS, I think AIDS the HIV epidemic. Um, you know, provides a, a really good model because there was the urgency of, of people dying now, a lot of people dying now. And then there was the added urgency of needing to educate people, treat people, and then prevent AIDS. And, and we really, or HIV, we did that, we're pretty successful at that in America. And we, we also are set like a global example, and we've helped a lot of other developing uh, countries. And that, that I think, was a, um, I think it was the Surgeon General's report of 1989 that got everybody's attention, along with some things that were happening in our society, that really began to turn the corner. And we have today, we have the Surgeon General's report of 2016, Vivek Murthy, Facing Addiction in America, that I hope will be kind of similar to that 1989 Surgeon General's report and beginning to really generate like a national effort to get at some of the root causes while, while treating, you know, while, 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 while responding to the urgency. Um, <clears throat> economic, very much, uh, economics very much play a, a, a crucial part in it. But also, and, I, and I, I know that you're acutely aware of, of stigma, that, that when the more people understand addiction as a brain disease that anyone can get, the less stigma there'll be and the more likely we'll be to take uh, meaningful action. Let's also go back to, as we mentioned, as we discussed before we came on the air was that when I first entered the workforce in the addictions and psychiatry field, the inpatient programs were called dual diagnosis. Mm. And that has morphed over time into co-occurring, people with co-occurring disorders. We mm -hmm. don't say someone has, someone is a dual diagnosis patient mm -hmm. any more than we say that someone is a schizophrenic, we say a person with schizophrenia, a right. person with mental health and substance use issues. And my soapbox on that is, it's a complex person. Yeah. You don't have to yeah. necessarily define them yeah. by their diagnosis. And we also used to say that you had to be sober for a period of time before you dealt with mm -hmm. mental health issues. Mm -hmm. The sequential model didn't work, and the parallel model didn't work. It's the integrated model yeah. of how we're going, the, the illnesses or the challenges play off each other. Yeah, yeah. If we don't address them simultaneously, we're doing a disservice potentially. Yeah, yeah. Beautifully, beautifully put. <clears throat> Sequential, parallel versus integration. I, I, I like that. And certainly, I didn't make it up. <laughs> oh, I like that. Certainly the, the field today is, is moving in that direction. Much more. You know, well, Todd, we're growing short on time. And um, I mean, I'd love to invite you back on the show. Um, you know, I think that you're, uh, you know, such a, you know, an experienced uh, guest and, and your, your heart is in, in, in the, the right place for sure. And um, I'd love to have you back on the show at some point. Um, I'd like to, I'm in the habit of ending the show with, with my, my guests talking directly to, the, uh, to our, our viewing audience. So although I hate to end the show, I think it's, it's time we, we end the show. So I'll give you the stage to um, make a comment to the viewing audience. And, and I hope to, I really hope to have you back on the show. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. I can only suggest that we keep doing what we're doing and building on the successes we've come a long way as we've talked about but we still have a long way to go and it's important to build on the successes and um, Ed mentioned retention. Retention in treatment is a huge issue 
and how do we address that even if treatment services are available. So there's a lot to think about and a lot to do, but I appreciate being able to be on the show. All right. Thank you, Todd. Thank you. Okay.